Hello out there YouTubers and welcome to P.E. Slick Podcast. I'm your host Matt here. Each week I'm going to bring you something different in terms of leadership, ministering, entertainment, book authoring, and much more. But before we begin each time, I'm going to be airing a classic throwback commercial from back in the 80s or 90s or 2000s for my personal liking. Stay tuned. What's great about Reynolds Wrap is, it's so strong. After you've cooked with it, it cleans up in a flash. Nothing works like Reynolds Wrap. And we're back, and joining me this week is Rick Goldsmith. Rick is very known for being a historian. Man, he has met with a lot of people, and he has a lot of interest in merchandise from back in the day, especially from Rudolph, and Santa Claus is coming to town, and I had the pleasure of meeting him last year of 2018 at the Mid-Atlantic Show in Hunton Valley at the Delta Hotel. And joining me right now is Rick. Hey, Rick. <laughs> hey, I'm just going. It's going good. I'm glad you was able to take some time out of your schedule to talk with me for a while. Sure. Uh, to get things started, um, where are you from? Uh, well, I'm in the Chicago area, and I'm in, in the suburbs, in a suburb called Oak Lawn, and uh, pretty much I was born here, so <laughs> I've lived my whole life in this area, and uh, in fact, Arthur Rankin came and visited me when I lived in Payless Hills, um, and he enjoyed uh, visiting and, and going. We went to this historic restaurant um, that had some serious wine. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> he was a connoisseur. He was a connoisseur of wine and had quite a collection in, it, in his New York home. Right. So uh, <laughs> he kind of enjoyed his uh, his trip to this area. Yeah. And, uh, and I love it. I love... Uh, this area, and you know, I've traveled around the country doing this this work for Rankin Bass, and Maryland was a was a great stop. You know, the uh, Mid Atlantic show. I'd like to do that show again because I did really well there. So yeah, it's fun to travel around the country and meet all the fans of Rankin Bass Productions. Right, right. <laughs> Um, I'm going to get into that in a second about meeting the celebrities and what have you. Um, the question I had that I was going to ask you was, growing up, uh, what were some of your hobbies? Well, um, music has always been a big thing for me. I play in a band called The Starting Artists, and I recorded with uh, the members of the Jim Blossoms. Oh. They're, <laughs> they're quite well known and... They're from Tempe, Arizona, so I recorded a few CDs there. In fact, they're on iTunes and CD Baby and all the downloadable sites under Rick Goldschmidt Sings. <laughs> um, so I think your listeners would enjoy the type of music that I play because it's sort of pop rock, you know, Jim Blossom style. Right. And uh, that that was always a big thing. And that, and that also drew me into Rankin Bass because Maury was the musical composer, and, and he lived in Appleton, Wisconsin. He passed away this year oh. in January, hmm. or was it March, March of this year. But, I mean, the guy was a genius. You know, he wrote <laughs> the Heat Miser and Snow Miser songs. And, right. They put one foot in front of the other and all the great mad monster parties he saw. So he, he was someone that I really looked up to and in fact his son lives in Chicago so we met at Christmas time or okay. Thanksgiving downtown and, and spent time together over dinner and discussing the Rankin Bass history. So. Right. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> music was always a big part. And then art, because my degree's in illustration. 
Oh. So Jack Davis and Paul Coker Jr. are two of my very favorite artists, and they designed on the Rankin Bass show. So that was another reason that I got into being a historian, because I had such a deep appreciation of the art. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think art world of art and music and crafts is a big importance to uh, you know, your line of work as um, historian of classic, classicness within Rankin. Um, I gotta tell you, I didn't know you was a musician. I mean, when are we <laughs> going, when are we going to see the album hit the shelves, you know? <laughs> well, um, my music, I, I did the first CD in 2006, so, and then, okay. You know, it's, it's been a while since I've been writing original songs, but we still play various performances for different things in the Chicago area. Right. And, um, you know, it's it's a fun thing. We, we practice once a week, and uh, we've got a lot of songs that we have in our set list now that sound really good. So um, it's something that I'll keep doing forever. Right. And I have a lot of uh, collectible guitars, too. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, a collector's call did a show on me for me TV, and it aired in during the premiere in April of this year. What? Yeah, uh, yeah. And the guitars were not a featured part of the show, but they could have done a whole episode on my guitars. Um, but they did an episode on Jim Peterick, who is from Survivor and wrote. Eye of the Tiger. Right. And his guitar collection was featured in an episode. But my episode, um, it was on their website, but now I think just the preview is up there, but you can see two scenes that weren't in the actual episode at their uh, website. I think it's collectorscall.tv or okay. collectorscall.com. Right. So I have quite a collection. It's like a museum, and it's not only rank and bass stuff. It's it's a variety of pop culture, um, mostly like television shows of the '60s and and movies of the of '50s and '60s and things like that. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your your business uh, rank slash bass. Productions. Um, for those that don't know, I mean, I know he's said a few things now, but for those that don't know, what is Rank Slash Bass Productions? Well, Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass formed a company in the late 50s, early 60s, and primarily it started out for commercials, right, to do commercial work, and then eventually it ended up being an animation studio in Japan hmm. uh, where they where they became known for stop motion, which, you know, today's audience would know Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, but right. it all started with, sort of started with the Rankin Bass Productions. They did the New Adventures of Pinocchio in that style, and they did The Wizard of Oz, Tales of the Wizard of Oz, in cell animation. Okay. But then, <clears throat> when they got Rudolph on the air in 1964, in that style, which was called Animagic, it took off to such a degree that it opened the doors for them to do everything that they wanted to do, not only in animation, but in live action, they produced um, King Kong Escapes with Toei, or, um, yeah, Toei, I think it was, in Japan. And then they did cell animation like Frosty and Pleasant Night Before Christmas. Um, they did feature films. They did Saturday morning television like the Osmonds and the Jackson 5 show and the King Kong show. They just did so much. <laughs> you know, right. It, uh, my first book is now 420 pages of everything that they did, and 
it's quite an amazing body of work, you know. It's, it's on the same level as Hanna Barbera and Walt Disney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and there, they, there were two pretty successful producers that have a body of work that they could really be proud of, you know. Yeah. Everybody that worked on the shows, like the writer Romeo Muller, Maury Lawrence did the music, Paul Coker Jr. and Jack Davis designed them all. I mean, these are like super talented guys. And what, what I do is I shine the light on them and people, so people don't forget it. The shows didn't just make themselves. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, these talented guys really put their heart and soul into it. And that's why Rudolph will be on 55 years this year. Frosty is 50. That's the big anniversary of this year. Here we saw the Santa Claus and twice the night before Christmas. Those are at uh, 45. Jack Frost is 40. So, I mean, he's, <laughs> these shows just keep going. And this year, Freeform is showing Rudolph, Frosty, and Santa Claus is coming to town, which they never did before. It's only been on the networks, you know, uh, Rudolph and Frosty on CBS and uh, Santa Claus is coming to town on ABC. Right. And the, and the reason they're doing that is because the guys who used to be in control of programming at Freeform left and went to AMC. Mm. And last year, AMC showed the Rankin Bass later specials like the year without a santa claus and the little drummer boy book two and some of the later ones pinocchio's christmas right they had a marathon uh, a highly successful marathon because they show a great time too so they're doing that again this year <laughs> so the exposure is greater than ever for the right and best tv shows Right, right. I, re I remember last year seeing that on AMC. So you you did answer some points there because they <laughs> they they weren't as you said they weren't locally known, um, only on CBS and ABC. And of course, back in the day, cable wasn't as advanced like it is now. So to for kids to watch it, they would have to turn on them local channels. And <laughs> you know, speaking back on that, we were talking about stop action of animation like they did with Rudolph and other animated shows from that time, you know, the technology has changed so much now, you know, it, you know, it, it'd be, I'm sure the kids of today would be amazed to find out just how fun and, I mean, it, it, it is a process with that animation, but they'd be amazed to find out how that animation spirit was then compared to the 3D style um, today with films and animation. Because they, they've been doing remakes of Rudolph and Santa Claus within that. Right. Yeah. Well, all the CGI, it started off great when Pixar did their earlier movies. They really cared about story and character development and all of that. And they, they were topping themselves each year. And, in fact, I was involved with all those guys. Um, really? A lot of them. My Rudolph book was has an afterword from Andrew Stanton who won the Academy Award for Finding Nemo and Wall-E. Yeah. And uh, Joe Ramp helped me with my Rudolph book, and he passed away, but he was a big part of Cars and Nightmare Before Christmas and yeah. a lot of those early movies. And now it seems like they've gotten so formulaic, sort of like the Marvel superhero movies that, they're not really movies anymore. <laughs> like Martin Scorsese, was it him that said, you know, those aren't real movies. I think he's right um, because they're like formulated, you know, things to do well at the theater, but they're not going to sustain the, <laughs> the years like the Rankin Bass. See, the Rankin Bass shows what makes what sets them apart is the writing. And Romeo Muller put a lot of heart and warmth. He reformed the villains. 
he had these underdog characters that everyone identifies with. Right. There, there's a magic to them. Um, and when you strip that away, you just got fluff, you know? Right. And a lot of today's entertainment is fluff, you know? People will say, hey, did you go see that movie? Or, you know, I got to go see that. And they go see it, and then a lot of them are like, what did I just see? <laughs> or it's forgotten about in, in a few months. And right. these things, they're not like that. You know, the Rankin Bass shows, everyone watches. You can watch Rudolph or The Year Without a Santa Claus a hundred times and still enjoy it. Right. And, and I think that was true of the early Pixar movies, too. Um, you know, they were on the right track, but somehow corporations get involved and it's all about making money and not so much about quality. And that's what I admire about Rankin Bass is the quality. Right. You know? They didn't hire people <laughs> right out of college and pay them $10 an hour or whatever, like a lot of these studios do now. Right. Rankin Bass hired these guys that had experience. And in the case of Jack Davis or Paul Coker or whoever, they were working for Mad Magazine and other magazines for 10, 20, 30 years already. Right. Before they designed Mad Monster Party and Frosty. So... There's a lot to be said for experienced, seasoned, talented people, and and that's what we had at Rankin Bass Productions. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Hey, I'm all for it, you know, and I, I totally support your work and what you're doing right now. It was a real honor meeting you last <laughs> year, and now I'm really honored because you didn't say a lot of names that I, I know. Uh, and um, which welcomes my next question. Um, you did talk about this stuff a bit. Um, how did you get into being a historian Well, doing what you're doing right now? Well, I just kind of fell into it um, after college because what I intended to do was become a commercial illustrator. Right. Um, sort of in the humorous illustration that, that Jack Davis worked in, and he was a very successful artist because he did a lot of advertisement art, you know, like, um, just to give you an example, so Spalding Baseball Clubs had Jack Davis art, right. or, uh, <laughs> I mean, all these big companies would hire his art for their ads, and I kind of wanted to do something like that. But then I, because I was talking to him and, and Paul Coker, and my curiosity was what happened to Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Best? They designed all of the the shows, and they said that they still occasionally did work for them. Right. And Rankin Best kind of ended their career with Thundercats and Silverhawks and the comic strip in the mid-80s, and that's when I was in college. Um, I, I graduated in 87. Okay. So I didn't even know about Thundercats, really. I, I mean, I might have seen some of the toys in the stores, and I might have flipped the channels and saw it back then, but I wasn't fully aware of the phenomenon that that was. Right. Um, so that whole generation remembers Rankin Bass for that. But um, I was just curious what happened to them because you didn't see or read or hear anything about them. So that's how I fell into it. It was like there should be a book, and if no one else is going to do it, I'll do it. Right. And I called Arthur Rankin up, and I said, "Let's. I need to do. Let's do a book." And he said, send me two chapters. And I did, and and then it just became my life's work from there. <laughs> uh, but it's fun, and, and it, it led to other things. And, and 
I got to design some of the early figurines at UNESCO based on Rudolph and Here Comes Peter Cottontail, and I co-produced uh, some of the CD releases like Mad Monster Party and um, Santa Claus is Coming to Town with Frosty. Okay. And then, and then <laughs> some of the DVDs and Blu-rays. I I worked on the Year Without a Santa Claus one and, and the Mad Monster Party uh, Blu-ray and DVD. So it's it's just been a lot of fun to uh, bring the history of the studio into the limelight. You know, and yeah. that, even in my collector's call episode. Lisa Welchel is the host from Facts of Life, and it turns out she grew up on Rankin Bass, and the little the little drummer boy was her favorite show. And mm. uh, we talked about my um, work with Rankin Bass in the episode, and um, highlighted this Mad Monster Party fork and spoon set that Arthur Rankin gave me. So. It was cool. It was neat the way they um, put it all together in the episode. And and it's something that I'm proud of because, you know, a lot of the history, especially the names, would be forgotten because big companies take over these shows. And, you know, look at Disney took over Marvel and Star Wars and and Jim Henson and all of that, and the the creators kind of get lost in the shuffle. Right. And, and I I don't like that. I, I would rather, you know, the real people who created the work should get the credit. Right. Absolutely. Um, you've, during, during your line of work, you've met a lot of celebrities. You have mentioned Joe Rav, so I'm, of course, I'm somebody that followed Disney and knows Joe, Joe Ram because he worked on a lot of Disney films from back in the day uh, and touched on a lot of them films that people don't know about, um, like Oliver and Company. Um, sure. And then he did uh, the joint Pixar and did a hand in um, Toy Story. He even was the voice of the toy Wheezy in Toy Story 2. Right. Um, and I'm like in um, A Bug's Life. Yeah. Um <laughs> You met him, um, Barbara Eden from Roger Magini. Um, oh, yeah. You, you met a lot of people. Um, what, what is that feeling like meeting these people? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's kind of a dream come true because I've become friends with a lot of these people. And, um, you know, like, uh, in, in the case of Rankin Bass, you know, I got for real lives to do the forward before he passed away and I became good friends with his widow I became good friends with Phyllis Diller and Art Carney uh, from the Honeymooners (laughs) Um, you know all these cool people that worked on the Rankin Dash shows before they passed away I kept corresponding with June Ferre was another one she did some Rankin Dash work but then when I started appearing at shows like Chiller Theater and, uh, you know, at Atlantic Nostalgia Con and I, I appear at the Hollywood show in Chicago, I became friends with, you know, the Leave it to Beaver cast and uh, Kathy Garber from Family Affair. I mean, there's a lot of people I grew up with that, that uh I always admire and to become friends with them is is kind of cool. And, uh, you know, everybody does what they do because there's fans of, of that stuff. And right. It seems like the fans of television of the 50s, 60s, and 70s are also fans of Rankin Bass productions, and I kind of represent Rank and Bass Productions to them, so it's it's you know always fun to uh, find out that your favorite stars were uh, are cool people too, you know, mm. nice people. Some of them, a uh, very few, are not 
what you thought they would be, but most of them are nice, um, you know, and it's it's great to appear there. I find that the Comic Cons are a little bit different, whereas with the younger crowd, the millennials, so to speak, um, they're not so much into the nostalgia things, and uh, they tend also not to be materialistic. Right. Uh, so that's not good for, for me when I'm selling books and autographs and T-shirts and things like that, but um, I really enjoy, like, the baby boomer shows that I do. And Mid-Atlantic is a perfect example because, you know, I did a few panels there and like, they were pretty full. And people have a lot of good questions and they're really into the history and, you know, the, the shows mean a lot to them because they've, they've been part of their holidays and part of their family life their whole entire life. So, uh, that's really what I enjoy. It's, it's um, when you find a show that has a lot of people that it means so much to them. Um, one I did was Dragon Con in uh, Atlanta this year. Okay. And they get 86,000 people there. Now, most of them are like Star Wars or, uh, you know, Marvel, newer kind of fans. But right. I did five panels there, and they were all crowded, and a lot of them came to my booth and and talked to me and bought stuff afterwards. So right. there's a large quadrant of of people in every state that love ranking bass. So it's it's kind of fun to go around and meet them all. Hey, you know, if I was in your shoes, which I hope someday to be, that's what I'm doing, I, I definitely would be in my own world, too, because, you know, there, there's tons of people I would love to meet someday as well. Um, where I met you at, I met celebrities as well. Um, I yeah. Think I think I'm one of the last few people that met this Diane Carroll. I, I hung a picture oh, of her. Yeah. I took a picture of when I met her last year. Yeah, so I, yeah, I saw at my last show I did. Um, I was at the Chicago Toy Show, and one of the dealers I liked there had a nice, beautifully painted um, Julia, I think it was a paper doll book. It was pretty big, and I, I wished I had had that <laughs> at the <laughs> other show to have her sign. Right. And I really didn't get to meet her. She was sitting not too far from me, and she was nice. And when I went over, Robert Wagner was talking to her. Right. But um, I wanted to talk to her about her appearance in Peter Gunn, because Peter Gunn's one of my favorite shows, and she played a, a singer um, in a serious episode. And you know, I didn't get a chance to talk to her about that, but that that that's a great show, and yeah, and she had a, a good part in it. I'm gonna have to. Look that one up because I um I know her better from her work on she was on Dynasty and right. she she was in uh the movie with uh, James Earl Jones um right. she she was she was in a, a class act and doing what but like I said doing what you do meeting all these people is it's an amazing feeling and I also feel it's a great feeling as well because um a lot of people that you meet from that time from the 60s and 70s and 80s, a lot of them are up in age now. And it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a good feeling when you meet them because tomorrow you never know. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm I always amazed at, uh, like, how certain people age versus others. You know, uh, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, I started meeting celebrities back in the day, like right out of college, when they weren't even charging anything. Right. Um, a lot of the places would just pay them to be there, and then they would just sign wow. whatever. And Adam West and Burt Ward and, and Van Williams, I, I went and saw them with 
quite a few times and and that's how it was and then later you know these prices of a hundred dollars hundred and fifty to take a picture in a photo things changed but uh yeah. you know I'm glad I got to meet them when they still looked like they did in the shows yeah uh, and all the good ones now seem to be fading away fast uh, so that's not good yeah these ever ready batteries have always offered value for money but now they're being replaced by ever ready's new zinc carbon battery silver seal in continuous tests silver seal lasts on average twice as long as even our power plus range but costs no more that's a lot more staying power for light sound and fun more power wherever you need it new silver seal from ever ready extraordinary power at an ordinary price all right youtubers i hope you enjoyed the first part of this podcast with rick goldsmith I learned a lot talking with him. I hope you have too by listening. Join me on Friday for the second half of my interview with Rick. Until Friday, have a good night.